Welcome back to Weatherbox. Happy first week of spring. If you're new here, my name's Steve. I make cool weather videos every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. If that's something that interests you, you might want to subscribe, help a guy out. My last video in this series about the top 10 tornado damage paths visible on Google Earth is by far my most popular video on this channel. So I decided to continue that series, and today we're going to be looking at four natural disasters and their damage that is visible on Google Earth. We're going to start with the least impressive disaster and then work our way to the last one, which is pretty mind-blowing. On January 12, 2010, a 7.0 magnitude earthquake struck on the border of the Caribbean Plate and the North American Plate. This is an area that has seen devastating earthquakes as far back as the 1700s, so it really wasn't anything new. The epicenter of the earthquake was about 25 miles to the west of Port-au-Prince, and it lasted about 30 seconds. Now, a lot of people like to compare this to the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake since that was a 6.9, so it's very similar in magnitude. And if you haven't seen it, here's my favorite video from that earthquake. Candy Maldonado with the hesitation, allowing Jose Canseco to score, and he fails to get Dave Parker at second base, so the Oakland A's take... take I'll tell you what, we're having a There's a big difference, though. That earthquake only killed 63 people. The death toll of the Haiti earthquake is estimated to be between 100 and 300,000. Port-au-Prince is infamous for its lack of building codes. It has a very high population density, and you have a lot of structures that just aren't set up to withstand any sort of earthquake, even a 7.0, which is still pretty strong, but it's not catastrophic. This is what Port-au-Prince looked like a year before the earthquake, and you can see a variety of different structures. This is probably more of a government building. These are all low-income housing, and these appear to be a bunch of businesses. This is immediately after the earthquake, and it's kind of hard to see, but on every single block, there are multiple structures that are piles of rubble. This building we were looking at before no longer has a roof. There are also mountains of debris in the streets, and people are just kind of roaming around not knowing what to do. Every single block in this massive city is a complete disaster. The earthquake demolished 250,000 homes and 80,000 businesses, and you can definitely see the effects here on Google Earth if you really zoom in. It seems like every year now, California sets a new record in terms of wildfires, but the 2018 campfire was particularly bad. The fire started early in the morning near the town of Polga, and by the end of the day, it had consumed the entire city of Paradise, California. This is the town of Paradise before the fire, and this is the town after. Honestly, you can't even really call it a town because there is nothing left. 90 people were killed and 19,000 homes were destroyed. People did not have enough time to evacuate. They were caught in gridlock traffic trying to go down this one lane road when there was a fire burning on either side. It looked like hell. It was a situation where the wind was so strong and the smoke was so thick that it was virtually impossible to fight the fire from above. This is a picture of paradise looking from above, and you can't even tell there's anything there. The incredible thing is you'll see foundation after foundation and shell after shell of a house, and then you'll randomly just see one that is totally fine and still standing. If we look at paradise today, the number one thing you notice is there's a lot less trees. Second, there are definitely some houses that are being built. My day job is actually mapping electric utility infrastructure for cities in California, and about a month ago I had a job where I mapped out this whole stretch along Pearson Road. It's really a reminder of how much goes into rebuilding a city. Not only do you have to rebuild the structures, but you have to rebuild all of the public and private utilities that go into keeping a modern city alive. Next, we're going to be looking at the damage from Hurricane Katrina, specifically certain areas of New Orleans. Hurricane Katrina made landfall about 60 miles southeast of New Orleans on August 29, 2005. The eye wall wind field was positioned just right so that the strongest winds were blowing water into Lake Pontchartrain causing multiple levees to fail. These levees were built to keep water out of the city because most of New Orleans is actually below sea level. Needless to say, this was absolutely catastrophic. 80% of the city was underwater, and some neighborhoods saw water depths of at least 20 feet. In particular, I want to look at the Lower Ninth Ward, which is an area of New Orleans that's very impoverished, and it also is an area that got hit the hardest by the hurricane. This is what the area looked like about a month before the hurricane hit, and this is what it looked like the day after. You can immediately notice that this levee in particular is broken, and that most of these houses are actually being 
being pushed eastward by the force of this water. The depth of this water is well above where the typical street sign sits on a telephone pole. Most of the houses in this area actually aren't very tall. They're like a maximum of two stories, so the only refuge people had was to sit on their roofs in the hot and humid 90 plus degree August weather after the hurricane just waiting to be rescued. If you look at downtown New Orleans, we can see there's not a ton of water on the eastern portion. There seems to be a few feet of water over by the Superdome, but not a ton, and this is where they were actually bringing people who needed temporary shelter. If we look at the Ninth Ward today, we can see that most people decided not to rebuild here. It only has about a third of the population it did before the hurricane hit. If we look at a random street view, you can still see some decrepit buildings, although I, I don't know if this is as a result of the poverty or the hurricane, and you can definitely see a bunch of lots and foundations where houses used to be about 15 years ago. And finally, to top it all off, we're going to be talking about the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami in East Japan. The earthquake occurred at 2.46 p.m. local time, about 50 miles east of the Miyagi coast. The 9.0 magnitude earthquake was the strongest ever recorded in Japan, and it created a devastating tsunami that killed about 20,000 people. We're going to go through the satellite imagery of the towns affected by the tsunami, mainly on the east coast of Japan in the Miyagi and Iwate prefectures. I do want to mention I'm clearly not Japanese, and I do not speak Japanese, so I'm probably going to get the pronunciations of these towns wrong, but I'm going to try my best. This is Minami Sanrika. It is a town in the Miyagi prefecture on the east coast. It's a a little inlet town and that's kind of the theme a lot of the areas affected by the tsunami were towns in these little inlets and that kind of allows the tsunami wave to get funneled and grow larger and then just wipe out the town unfortunately this is what it looked like before the tsunami and this is what it looked like after tsunami you'll notice a common theme with a lot of these towns they put the houses in a lot of these low-lying areas but there is some higher ground like this is 60 70 feet up here in elevation which the tsunami waves really didn't get that high so if people had ample time they could migrate to those areas. Here's what the city looks like today. Another common theme is that they didn't decide to rebuild in the low-lying areas. You see there's a lot more new housing up here. This town in particular lost 30% of its population since 2010, which is also a common theme. All the towns affected have not grown in population, they've decreased. Now we're a bit farther north. This is the town of Kesanuma, and this is an instance where Google Maps only has uh, part of the imagery from 2009, but you can get an idea of what the town looked like. It's pretty densely populated, and you have a lot of housing located on this strip right here. And unfortunately, the tsunami wiped down pretty much anything residential on this entire strip. You can see we have a couple warehouses standing, but those are probably built a lot stronger than the housing. And today, the city actually looks pretty good. Um, there's not a lot of housing in this area. Um, a couple new apartment buildings, uh, a lot of new warehouses, though, in the lower-lying areas. A little bit further north, this is the town of Otsushi. Again, it's another inlet town. It has a low-lying area where all the houses are, and it's surrounded by these 500-foot hills. This town got hit particularly bad. There are virtually no structures left anywhere along this inlet coast. Luckily, there's a lot of housing here and over here, so these people were fine. Um, and once again, it was an instance where if people had enough time, uh, there is a hill that right here, it's 200 feet above sea level. So this would have been just fine if they could get up to this hill. Today, some of that housing was rebuilt. It was an interesting decision to not build to the south of this railroad track. I'm not sure why that is. And this town lost 28% of its population since the tsunami. This is the town of Yamada, and it's kind of interesting because it's it's one of the few that sit uh, not only in a little inlet, but kind of this bay. So um, that definitely had a different effect on how the tsunami waters rushed into the city. Many houses that were in this lower lying area were destroyed, but this area over here and over here and even here are all about 30 feet above sea level. So once again, um, if people had enough time to just run down the street, they could have outrun the tsunami potentially. This is what the city looks like today, and you can see the rebuilding process is a bit more sporadic. There are a lot of empty houses. Um, it seems like there wasn't a clear decision on how close people wanted to build uh, to the water. But nonetheless, it has seen a 23% population decline since the tsunami. Finally, we will be looking at the much larger city of Ishinomaki. There are so many more towns that were affected by the tsunami, but if I went over all of them, this video would be like 40 minutes long. So 
we're just going to stick with this one. You can see right off the bat that this industrial area was heavily affected. I believe there was actually a fire burning in this plant for a couple days. There's a ton of driftwood and rubble in this whole residential section, and a lot of houses were completely destroyed that were right along this inlet near the river. And if we look at the area today, you can see that a lot of it is just left empty. But there's one thing in particular I want to look at. This right here was actually designated as a Tsunami Memorial Park. And this imagery is from 2016, so it probably looks a little bit different today. I think there's like a statue there and some artwork and whatnot, um, and you can walk through this area. We can take a look at Street View imagery from 2013, and you can see it's really weird. There are just random, empty, abandoned houses sort of dotted throughout this barren landscape. This one has no doors and no windows on the first floor. This one also doesn't have any windows on the first floor, as well as drywall and insulation missing. This house is a really weird design. I think this is all plywood, and once again, we have pretty much the entire first floor ripped out. I have no idea how this one was still standing for two years after the tsunami, and this one appears to be built on stilts, so I'm not sure what's up with that. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you want me to look at more stuff on Google Earth, please let me know in the comments. I love doing this. And I hope you guys have an awesome first week of spring. I will see you next Wednesday.